Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. As you know that I've been looking into our deep Islamic history, I've been trying to find out a few of those big personalities from the past and take away some key lessons. So I dragged Sheikh Abid here and I have the next person on my list, Sheikh, I have Fatima. I want to know a bit more about her. Uh, so Fatima, her story is one of the most incredible stories to learn from, to be inspired by, and actually even it's such an enjoyable story to recollect. It's a story of uh, a scholaress, a story also of a daughter with her father, a story of a wife with her husband. But knitting that all together uh, was the overarching story of, of course the Hanifi method which is one of the four recognized canonical um, mainstream sort of schools of Islamic jurisprudence and what had happened is the Hanifi school of thought had really mushroomed and so it had spread across quite a vast stretch of land and it was the official school of thought used you know by the judiciary and the like and so you ended up having many different emerging expert opinions on you know subsidiary issues yeah. so now is a question of how do you how do you manage all of those opinions within the school itself in her time her own father was someone who was a great scholar right and so she would sit there and she she was gifted and endowed by Allah with an incredible degree and level of intelligence. She would study under him and eventually as she studied with him more and more she, she demonstrated her capabilities and eventually he kind of would send her to other scholars of that time and she'd study under them as well. Sorry Sheikh, I just want to highlight that she as she became a scholaress, but her father would send her to other scholars to study as because well. The, the, the dynamic was one where he, he could see her, her aptitude, her capabilities, and he was like, I'm not going to let this get wasted. You know, she's, she's uh, not just a testament to me, she's uh, also going to be an asset for the Islamic heritage and the Islamic uh, tradition. I think so, that's amazing. So, you know, he, he believed in her and he thought, what, no, what more noble cause could there be for one son? Or one's daughter than to actually be in the path of Islamic learning right and to be an expert in the field and she became someone known and uh, noteworthy in her time um, I would say the, the, the historians mention that you know both for her intelligence uh, she was also a woman who's uh, according to them known for, for her beauty as well so she was sought after in terms of propose, proposals and the like um, some of the the dignitaries you know from the the people who ran the council and you know the judiciary they, they actually asked for her hand in marriage wow her father used to run his own classes and had some uh, illustrious students of his own one such student was by the name of Abu Bakr al-Kasani. So Kasan uh, it was a part of Samarkand itself. Samarkand and Kasan are in present-day Uzbekistan. And so anyway, they, they were within this village, ultimately in, in Uzbekistan, and uh, Abu Bakr somehow managed to pluck up the courage. And he went and asked for her hand in marriage. He, he approached his own sheikh, his own teacher. It could be quite um, daunting. And it? said, you know, it must have been daunting. You, you can't quite imagine what that, what those, uh, that, that walk up to his door, knock, knock, and say, you know, you don't have class right now. And he's like, actually, I'm here for a different to question. <laughs> come to ask you a different question, to, to, to ask the ultimate question of, of sorts. And so what happens is, he says, okay, I'm going to ask her. So he then goes and consults his daughter Fatima and says, look, Abu Bakr has asked me for your hand in marriage. Uh, she's, now remember, she's not, um, she's a distinct, you know, scholaress. And, you know, her father himself recognizes that, you know, Abu Bakr is very capable, but she is probably more knowledgeable than him. Wow. Right. Because she's been studying with him. He's not in your now. league. He's not in your league, but I'm just So, so, so how, how do we get him on, 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 on the level? Yeah. So she stipulates, she says, I'll marry him on one condition. The book that you've written, the Hanafi Fiqh Manual, Tuhfat al-Fuqaha, the, the prize of the jurists. Um, I want him to write a commentary on that book itself. 
So he goes back and he's sitting there, you can imagine like any hopeful groom to be. And he's like, um, is this going to be a yes or is it going to be a no? You know, which way? And he says, it's kind of dependent, yes. It's a contingent yes. If you can write a thorough commentary on her father, on my manual that I've written on Fanny Fiqh, and you prove your capabilities in, in Islamic law, then she'll marry you. So off he went and he starts writing. And um, I have the, the commentary at, uh, at home and you've got it in there in 12 fat volumes. 12. And those 12 volumes were to end up being the maha wow. that he would give to his wife to be Fatima. Also and, what a legacy. and what a legacy. And what's remarkable also is that in the process of this, her father, as, as you know, history has its effects on, on, on scholarship in the sense that books got lost, wars took place, you know, libraries got uh, pillaged exa exactly tragically. Her father's work has not actually survived, at least as far as we found, we haven't been able to find it yet. However, her husband's work, which was a commentary on her father's work, wow. has survived. And it is one of the most authoritative and remarkable and distinguished works in Hanifi Fiqh. Bada'i al-Sana'i. Like a miraculous, you know, effort that's been made in terms of uh, a commentary on the Hanafi school of, of thought. And it relies on the earlier sources of the Hanafi school itself. That's amazing. I can only think of the sincerity he had, not just for the purpose of marriage, but for completing the work, for it to be such a lasting piece. And, and, and what's remarkable is that he must have been wanting to get through that work as quickly as possible, <laughs> but he still managed to maintain the yeah, 12, caliber of, 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 of standard to be able to present to her father and to her. And they both examined it. And then he would go on and teach his own commentary in other places, they, they moved, they, they traveled to uh, Aleppo, um, Halab in, in, in Syria. And, you know, he was, would teach it. And sometimes a student would ask a question about it. And he'd say, just give me a, uh, just wait a tick. And he'd go, ask his wife, back it and give an answer. Until eventually some of the students said, this happened four or five times over the period of, you know, some months. Where does Sheikh go? And it, Transpired he asked that Google. basically he would go and ask his wife, mm -hmm. who was he, whom he would recognize as the greater authority. Mm -hmm. And then he'd come back and share the answer. And in fact, even the, uh, one of the, the governors of the area, it was in Aleppo, uh, Nuruddin Zinki, or Zenki, would actually, had asked for her to become an official, uh, part of his council you know, that as a legal advisor to the government of the day. And she, was, she stood head and shoulders clearly above everyone, so, almost does, everyone else. And so he said he needed her counsel and advice. And, you know, her husband would facilitate that. And, and this is the extent of her scholarship at that time. It's phenomenal to think that this was so early on in Islam. But given the context of uh, women at that time, let alone women in our time. This is 587 Hijriya. Around uh, 11, in the 1180s of the common era. Absolutely unheard of for women to be excelling firstly in education, scholarship, and then to be put in part of government. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, honestly. But what's remarkable is they were not amazed. Yeah. This was something mainstream, mainstay and, you know, very imaginable for them. And it's part of a history that we're, we're not aware of. And ultimately, it's because they respect the tradition so much, the knowledge of Islam, and they recognize it as being the birthright of every single individual, and especially those individuals who are endowed with capabilities and, and, and aptitude. And, you know, they, they put their, their best investment, their children, into positions where they could actually flourish in that respect. SubhanAllah, that's, that's amazing. You can see the bond between the father and daughter for him to push her in the right way, seeking her permission, having that kind of close-knit relationship. Then you see her husband's relationship with her. I mean, she sounds like someone who was so grounded but had the respect of others, you know? The fact that she even allowed or behaved in such a way which allowed for her husband to ask her questions 
just showed how she must have been towards him and not felt or made him feel even inferior. Absolutely. Or, uh, rile up some sort of and ego. And you know what? It, it, the, the fact that she married another person on, on, on a similar path to her own, a fellow student of knowledge, you could say, yeah. it meant that they could keep that journey going together, oh, which was quite uh, quite sweet and remarkable at the same time, I think. It's amazing to keep that up. Alhamdulillah. I think the key lesson for me for her story is the fact that she was... Uh, an exemplary woman and we don't talk about those examples often enough and I think there's something to uh, as a key point for me personally that's why I wanted to ask you about Fatima specifically yeah and and you know that as a father he didn't differentiate between his sons and his daughters he believed in aptitude and you know she became the greatest credit to his own scholarship thereafter that's amazing Ultimately, it reminds me also of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, That when a human being passes away, all of our deeds are severed from us, except for these three ongoing, lasting sources of benefit that are kind of a source of ongoing yes. blessings for ourselves, even once we've passed on from this world. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said, knowledge which benefits a person. When you leave that knowledge behind, that acts as a source of ongoing ben benefit and blessing for me alongside those who are still living. Um, and he said, a, a righteous child. And he mentioned charity. So literally in the so case like of three Fatima, you know, he had the three in one as a testament to his father, to her father. Her father is really recognized and remembered as a result of the scholarship of his daughter. That's amazing, subhanAllah, Sheikh. And I think for me, really, it comes down to her personality in who she was, not as a scholaress. And her determination. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, her aptitude, her capability, but in the sense that she was able to keep her relationship with her father and her husband in a way which didn't rile them in their egos or kind of made them feel inferior. And I think that's a beautiful testament to her actual wisdom as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.